Cool. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the final event of our Race in Place seminar series uh, featuring our speakers from the semester. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Mickey Fern is not able to join us today due to an unexpected conflict. Um, but in his stead, we are happy to have uh, Dr. Stacey Nelson, as well as, of course, Dr. Bethany Cutts and Dr. Jennifer Richmond Bryant. Um, and Dr. Nelson will be joining us as a panelist for this event instead of the moderator. And I will be filling in uh, for the moderator position. So as a reminder, uh, please keep yourselves on mute and your videos off. Um, and our format is going to be about one hour of curated questions for the panelists. And then the last 30 minutes uh, will be open for audience questions. And we will have the link to a Google form in the chat for anyone who would like to submit questions. So yeah, let's get started. Um, first, some brief introductions. If you could each please introduce yourself by giving a brief just overview of your work um, and your research. So if I don't have a volunteer first, then um, Jen, do you mind starting? No, not at all. Uh, so I uh, teach in the forestry and environmental resources department. For undergrads, I'm in the environmental technology major. Uh, for grad students, I uh, advise a student in the CGA and another in natural resources. My personal focus is on air pollution exposure and looking at how that impacts communities. So um, community engaged research and environmental justice is not all that I do, but it's an important facet of my work that I'd like to see kind of woven through. Uh, right now, my biggest project is working with a community in Louisiana who uh, the community is subject to a, uh, a thermal treatment plant that handles hazardous waste and military munitions. And they are using uh, an open burn, open detonation type of system. So basically they're putting material on open plates and dousing it with some kind of fuel and burning it. It's the only permitted facility of its type in the country, although there are military operations that do the same thing. So, so you'll see that at some military bases. So, um, so we are working to uh, capture community members' experiences and uh, get ready to do some air sampling that reflects what we've learned from the community. Um, I've been doing this work for several years, but I was at the EPA for about 11 years in between this and another experience working at City University of New York. And they were, I was a little more focused on, on health and exposures around schools. Awesome, thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, Stacy, do you mind going next? No, I'm happy to. <clears throat> you know what? Let's let's do ladies first. Can I come back? Can we do Dr. Cuts? Sure. Hello, my name is Dr. Cuts. I'm a lady. <laughs> Alleged. I have I have no comment there. <laughs> um. In the before times, Stacy's office is down in the hall from mine. We are the only two people that drank the Diet Cokes. <laughs> now I would be accused of drinking all the Diet Cokes in the soda machine. Okay. But <laughs> in my spare time, when I'm not drinking Diet Coke, I, um, I'm an associate professor in parks, recreation, tourism management, and a faculty fellow in the Center for Geospatial Analytics. And um, I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> I really know what I do. No. Um, How would you do everything, right? Comprehensively, my group is really interested in um, leveraging academic expertise to help communities reach their goals. And I say that in a broad way, um, because I don't think researchers, my personal perspective is that researchers can't provide solutions, but they can provide information. And then we can use that experience to understand why as a land grant university, it might be easier for us administratively or epistemologically to work with some stakeholder groups over others. Um, and that's where I see the potential for me to to leverage my position and make change. Um, the more I think about that, the happier I am with that as an answer to why I, as like a 
white woman with the privilege of a tenured position um, can can do work that um, that that fits into an environmental justice framework without disconnecting the roots of environmental justice as a as a really a social movement led by um, people in North Carolina, um, both black, black indigenous and other people of color um, in North Carolina and across the world. And sorry, this is where <laughs> there's too many tabs open on my computer. Um, but anyway, without disconnecting that important history from um, the potential for that to be uh, useful in leadership going forward. So, um, you know, in terms of conventional ways of thinking about academia, I've spent the last few years trying to figure that out for myself. Um, I want now. I think I'm in a good place with it. That feel does not feel gross or hypocritical. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and finally, Stacy. Yeah, and so I'm one of those folks that do a little bit of everything and anything just because I don't do anything particular, any one thing particularly well. Um, so I'm currently serving in the Dean's office right now as an interim associate Dean for diversity and inclusion. And so we're just really super excited to be helping support this, um, this, uh, uh, CGA graduate student organization initiative. I just, first off, think it's just really wonderful that, that this is a student led student driven type of, uh, uh, of event and that there's much more planned that's, that's forthcoming. And so it just really speaks to the incredible power that students have to really create just organization, activity, awareness, everything else. So thank you. And I know this is a crazy time of the year when everybody's stressed out, zoomed out, and uh, just trying to find time for one more engagement activity tends to be tough. So thank you guys for taking your time. Um, but what I typically do, so I'm, I'm a professor in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources, been with the CGA, goodness, when it was the Center for Earth Observation. Um, and there was only really five uh, uh, faculty. And then we had a few more teaching professors with us as well, too. And we were pretty much responsible for running and teaching a little bit of everything and anything here. Um, so when I wasn't teaching, I was actually attempting to do research. The majority of my work revolves around uh, using remote sensing technologies, but also GIS, GPS as well too. Um, don't get into a lot of the heavy programming stuff, but more image analysis based work where we look at issues of land use change, land use, land cover change and its impact or influence on habitat. And so whether that's aquatic habitat, which is my primary background focus or training but as well uh, terrestrial habitat change. And also if I can just comment on, on one thing Jen brought up about those open fire pit things. I just saw on the news, goodness, a couple nights ago, John Stewart was, is leading a veterans kind of healthcare initiative act or bill, apparently like in Afghanistan and probably a lot of the other bases around the world, they're burning a lot of everything from from trash, from materials to you name it, goes into these fire pits. And unfortunately, our servicemen and women are inhaling a lot of those toxic fumes and they're coming up with some severe uh, health issues, health problems. The sad part, of, well, it's sad that they're, they're coming up with those health issues, but then the, the double sad part about it is that they're coming home and they're not getting the proper care and treatment and they're going through a lot of hoops and hurdles to prove that the afflictions were caused by the inhalations from all of these different toxic chemicals. I mean, everything, sewage, you name it, they're, they're, they're burning everything at these bases. And so they're having a really hard time proving that that was the initial cause. And so just thinking about um, disparities and how they in, impact uh, communities of color, people of color, poor, rural, those sorts of things. It's interesting that we can associate something very similar to the people that we're depending on to give their lives to protect us as well. And interestingly, just to, just to add to that, and 
the army is aware of that there's a registry that they've created in recent years to try to track uh, service people who have been exposed to um, to these burn pits and um, you know just to kind of add to the uh, human aspect of it oftentimes those who choose to go into the military are those who maybe you know are trying to find a way to afford college a few years down the road or who maybe don't have higher education in their sites and um, you know, there are socioeconomic aspects to that that, that get tied into. So, um, so it does become an issue of those who we're asking in our, in our society, whether it be a community where we decide to place a facility or a community that is then expected to go and shoulder our military burden um, where, you, where you do see the worst of the exposures imposed upon upon those individuals oftentimes. Thank you for sharing. I mean, honestly, like jumping off that, Jen, I know you've seen um, a lot of stuff like that in terms of air, air pollution inequality. Um, for all our panelists, how, how have you grappled with questions of inequity and bias in your own work, whether this is from the aspects in which you're directly researching or aspects of maybe top-down um, practices, whether it's from the institution or uh, just rules that have been put on you when you're doing your research? Um, and how have your experiences shaped your career path? Do you want me to go first on that? Um, Anyone, if you have, if you're ready, you go ahead. You know, I, I think, a lot of that, I mean, a lot of these questions come up in, in different communities that I've studied. Um, and my experience is not that that lengthy because I did have the bulk of my career kind of cut where I was working on something different. But as far as my community work, you know, these questions have sort of defined the problems that I look at. And I, I think you know, Bethany was sharing a lot in, in her introductory statement about the kind of the privilege of working with communities and the privilege that we have to be in this position. And I think over time, trying to sort of grapple with these problems is um, tightly linked to seeing ourselves as in service with these communities. And so it's not like we're out there like, you have a problem, I bet you didn't know that, and heading in and, you know, saying like, well, here's how I'm going to fix your problem. That's not what, you know, that's not what communities want. That's not what is ethical to do. But, you know, as I've continued in this work and sort of learned to be a better listener over the years, um, I think just trying to hear people's stories and trying to validate their stories and use that information to come up with measurements that might help to substantiate experiences is kind of the way that I've learned to grow. Certainly in the Louisiana work, that's been an important part of it is just talking and hearing people's stories and then responding with, you know, here's what maybe we should be looking out for rather than the other way around. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, Stacy, go ahead. I'll just add to, I'm sorry, Bethany, were you gonna jump in there? I'll just, I'll just add just a little bit to that. Um, you, you know, Ian, when you ask, you know, or, or what if, or, 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 or what about uh, the, the institution even imposing restrictions on you and I'm gonna, step out there just a little bit of a little controversially um so sometimes the peer review literature or periodicals are not necessarily the venue that's going to reach the most people in some of this type of work and unfortunately 
I take that back. I did not say unfortunately. Um, as as um, responsible, there we go, responsible scientists and researchers that are dedicated to enhancing the knowledge and education of the scientific community. How's that sound? Is that pretty good? Uh, we have the responsibility to make sure that the work that we do shows up in the peer reviewed literature to further advance knowledge and discovery, right? But, you know, folks in Southeastern Louisiana are not gonna, gonna read um, environmental management or ecology or, or those sorts of things. However, you know, we're driven uh, to look at more or less the peer reviewed publication just to ensure that you know, we're meeting our obligations, um, but that may directly conflict with us spending more time to get out a message or share information that directly educates the communities that are affected. Did I say that, did I say that carefully enough? I actually want to respond to that point though, because, and this is something I've heard from the community that we're working with, is they've actually articulated a desire for us to publish some of this work because they want to launch it into the sphere where policymakers are going to respond. And oftentimes when you're dealing with um, something like air pollution policy, you need to have things validated through the peer reviewed literature before it can really be taken into account, news stories are not held to the same standard. And so they're not considered the same way in, in terms of informing policy. And actually the, the leader of the community group that we've been working with in Louisiana said to us, no, I want you to be taking the time to publish this because that's what we need for EPA region six to start listening. And so, um, and the other side of that too is that oftentimes we don't really need to be educating the community because the community already knows what they have. Mm -hmm. They want, in, in at least the case for this study, it might not be all studies, but I think what they really want is for us to be characterizing that in a careful way so that they can use it to try to make change at the policy level so that what's happening to them is not doesn't happen anymore. And so I, I just want to raise that point. There's the other side of it where in terms of the public education piece, you might not be necessarily educating the people in the community but maybe generating outrage in people from other surrounding communities who can then lend support. And that's where the public education issue also often happens too. Absolutely. I think both of those point, both of those examples are a great illustration of the same point, right? Like that the experts, in what the community needs is the community. <laughs> um, and we, like oftentimes it's easy to give that same, that level of, um, I don't know if authority is exactly the word I intend, but to, to other forms of partners. I mean, when you think about like um, corporations that might form public part, private partnerships with institutions like they have quite a bit of say over how when where <laughs> I mean not 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 to the extent that they should be um, influencing the results directly but but in terms of the venues in which those they're shared and and communicated they have quite a bit of control and so being able to to listen to and and acknowledge that form of expertise in in other stakeholder groups is not something that's as easy for large land grant institutions to do. Um, and so it, it challenges a lot of the internal systems. I had another point related to what the question. Um, 
but I don't remember what it was. But just adding to that though, Bethany, I mean, we're getting better, right? I mean, we are getting better at being Sometimes. able- Sometimes, I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, it's worth thinking about in relationship to like budget shortfalls and, and what the public goods are that, that a, a land gr grant institution, a predominantly white institution at that, are, are charged with delivering. I mean, educating the North Carolina public is kind of the most direct and simple one, but the outreach, um, and it's hard to talk about outreach and extension in a way that really captures what it could be um, is, a, is, is part of the value of research. And I think in an increasingly global society, it's both like, listening to what people need and, and advancing opportunities to think really differently. And I think that um, that thinking about that comprehensively, you know, within our realm of natural resources, within this area of kind of like geospatial analytics since we're here today, is challenging when you think about like where money comes from and where, where it goes. Um, and how to like reconcile differences in the values kind of conventional stakeholders and emerging ones might have in terms of what what counts and qualifies as a public good. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm coming off like a, a pretty harsh comment from National Science Foundation on one of my students. Um, like inquiries that said our, our environmental justice work was too advocacy centered. I'm like, I think it's policy implementation science, <laughs> but like in this complicated realm of understanding why and how different groups get recognized in disaster. Um, I haven't had time to really like, but at the same time, a different student who's more quantitative, <laughs> um, got feet, you know, just received a graduate research fellowship for algorithmic fairness research and data equity. <laughs> so it's kind of a, like, like how and what counts as knowledge is really complicated in this space because her big data stuff is a meaningless without this other student doing more qualitative work to kind of uncover the assumptions that are built into some of that some of those initiatives and algorithms. That might be more rant than comment, sorry. <laughs> I think it's a good point though, because there is a broader question about how different types of data are valued. And you know, when you're getting into questions about equity or inequities and bias, even the way that we that we value different kinds of information and different kinds of knowledge becomes important. I mean, even, you know, you see that played out in the state budget where they want to throw a lot of money into STEM education and, you know, cut budgets for other cultural endeavors. And thinking about that in terms of training future, you know, people who are going to be working in the workforce in all different kinds of areas, what do we, you know, how do we teach people to assimilate contexts? And this is a little bit above and beyond EJ, but it's important for EJ because without, you know, without the context, the data is meaningless, as Bethany already said, but it, it really does, does become important when we're thinking about the numbers and how, how money is allocated and um, it's, it almost seems like the, the trick to it is basically to make your work sound really quantitative and then sneak in the qualitative stuff to, <laughs> you know, to try to, um, to do that work as well. Yeah. Well, I have a, I have a question for Stacy based on the prompt we're all allegedly responding to, if that's okay. So um, the question... <laughs> The question we have a script that we're following. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> question, the question that Ian asked that you wrote to ask to not yourself, but that I think that I'm interested in your response to is about this institutional part and how like in your role as, um, I'm forgetting your precise title. Yeah, interim associate dean. 
Um, yeah. Inclusion. Okay, interim, interim associate dean of diversity inclusion. Like, how has what insight into the way the university thinks about um, issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity have you gained through that role um, in turn that you wouldn't necessarily have had um, had you just remained? faculty member with an extremely strong record of recruiting and su supporting students who with underrepresented identities and from um, historically black colleges and universities, which I know you is like, I'm sh shout out to you for, for being so, so strong committed in that, in that space. I've seen it in action and heard it from down the hall. Yeah, well, when, <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I leave here at like 8 p.m., when I leave this, the CGA at 8 p.m. and you're still in there working with your students, I don't feel too guilty <laughs> just waving and leaving you guys. No, I do feel guilty, Bethany. <laughs> but, but, but to that same, to that same uh, context, it, 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 it really takes all of us, doesn't it? It really takes all of us. It takes all of us really being willing to make a difference and make a change. But what have I seen since being in this role? I'll have to say that, you know, being a faculty member um, is a little bit different because you get to be the kind of the king of your own uh, thief, thiefdom, right? You're, you're, you get to, you know, you're bringing your own money, you're in control, and pretty much you have the latitude to, to you know, hire the students you want to, bring in, design the research the way you want to, uh, respond to the deadlines from the sponsors and write your reports, write your publications and, uh, and that's it, right? Um, being on this side and really trying to advocate for more of the work that, that, that all of you are doing and making sure that it counts and making sure that it's incentivized and also rewarded um, other than just good job, Dr. Cutts, you get a pat on the back for that. We we appreciate that. Now, where are your, where are your grants and your publications? Um, what I've had to learn is that, you know, this is a system that has persisted for a very, very long time. It's hard to change meritocracy. It's hard to change the ideologies that we can be great, but we need to look at measuring that in much different ways. Look at it as well in, in ways that we're able to reach all levels and all communities that we represent and we serve. Look at it from ways that we're able to really improve access uh, and opportunities for folks. You know, those aren't necessarily the things that come up in those rankings, right? The, you know, the dollar amounts that, we're, that we're, we bring in $500 million a year in, 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 in research dollars. And so, you know, we're ranked right up there with the big boys, right? You know, the, the, well, not the MITs and those guys, but still we're ranked up there. Right? Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's hard to really change that. And I think that you've got so many people that are so nervous about being innovative and being leaders and really looking at new perspectives on how we value the work that we all do. So Dr. Cutts, when I see you up there at eight, eight o'clock at night, uh, uh, pouring over the desk with your, with your graduate students, you know, those kind of things, that extra that it takes to really make sure that we're, we're having that level of reach and that level of impact are the things that should be making us great, right? Um, and I know I'm going to sound cynical. It, it, it shouldn't be your pub count, you know. It it really it should be what <laughs> your publication count. Oh, pub it, count, it, yeah. Your publication. It, it really should be, you know, who you are, your heart, what you put into this, how what, what it takes to make a difference, and those are the kind of things that if I had my big magic wand and if I could change minds and hearts, that's what I would really love to do. And since we have all these young folks that are on, on, on the call here, you know, that's what you guys will have an opportunity to do because every time we get these young, and I'm not, I don't have anything against us older people, older folks like myself, but it's the younger folks that are more risk. I mean, they're willing to take those risks. They're willing to make those changes. They're willing to ask, why can't things be different? Why can't we do things different? Why do we 
just because this is the way that we've always had to do it, why do we have to keep doing it that way? What? You asked that kind of question? And I think that's like, um, a, I mean, that's a big part of norm change that doesn't take necessarily any kind of policy change is like record. And then I like to like make fun of slash highlight Catherine Stevenson's work on intergenerational learning, because I think within academia, the power, like there's hierarchies and those have served some purposes. Um, but when it comes to like issues of innovation, as you say, um, really being, having the humility to realize you can learn from everyone um, in order to like find creative, helpful, and maybe even simpler <laughs> ways to do things, yes. I think is really important. And I think relates back to the original question in, in kind of two ways in terms of institutional structure and just like, if you're gonna do one thing, you're never gonna go to a diversity training, but you can like decide to take young people seriously. And, and if you're young, decide to take older people seriously, like that's an easy lift, very easy lift <laughs> to look people in the eye, also an easy lift. Um, but, and, and I think it relates to another thought that I've been having a lot because of the, this um, data equity independent study I organized this semester. So um, some of the people that are in the course are on here, but for those who aren't, I just was recognizing in my own students that we needed like a more structured space to really think about data equity. Um, and we needed that space to be restorative and to recognize a lot of this hidden effort that folks were putting in. So I made an independent study because my suspicion was a lot of people were already working on this either because they wanted to or because their personal identity made it so there was no way they were not going to be allowed not to right now. <laughs> um, and so as a challenge to really use that time and to, and to be recognized for it and also to meet and read, read some things that would be um, restorative and thought provoking together. So the restorative part is this black feminist lessons from marine mammals called Undrown. It's by Alexis Pauline Gounds. She's a, some kind of poet, magician, academic that lives in Durham and her book is awesome and it's short. Um, but it takes a really intersectional approach to understanding, thinking about, and really like using um, hum hu like the humanities to unpack a lot of the assumptions of science by, by being really intentional about, about the way it talks about and looks at, um, at the way scientific guides discuss marine mammals and also sharks in one section. Um, and that is is the restoration and it has little activities and I force people to do those um, to build community. And then we are also reading Automating Inequality, which is by a sociologist and this looks at how algorithms, um, even the best intentioned ones, um, reinforce ideas of the worthy and unworthy poor and create systems where social services really serve to manage poverty rather than solve it. And it is uh, depressing as H-E double hockey six. That's why we need the other book um, because it's so deep inside some of these, some of these algorithms. Um, and, but thinking through some of the language in that second book, you know, they talk a lot about the automation of the state of Indiana's um, I'm gonna say welfare system, but I'm not 100% sure I'm talking about the right thing. Um, but the t but it essentially was a changeover from a case management system to a task management system. And so I've been thinking about that a lot in parallel to what academics can bring to, um, can bring to equity concerns. Mm -hmm. And the thing we can bring is task expertise because of the way academic training works. Uh, it's very rare to find somebody who grew up very close to where they went to college, which was very close or identical to where they went to grad school, which is very close or identical to where they currently work. 
I mean, I think Ryan Emanuel might be the closest person I could think of to, to being able to accomplish that. Um, but most Kate, in most, and he can do special things because of that. But most of us are not that. Um, and so expecting ourselves or, or encouraging other people to expect that we can, that we have deep historical local knowledge is disingenuous. Um, so we need to connect that up with case management knowledge through nonprofits or local partners or other entities that are deeply invested in place in ways that we can't necessarily be. And that those connections between the vertical, vertical and horizontal knowledge bases can be really powerful if, if people are able to come into it with adequately resourced um, and appropriate intentions. Can I uh, butt in? Yes. That, I mean, on, honestly, thank you all for your answers. Um, I mean, it seems that in this discussion, it really comes down to a central theme of how much are we treating science as advocacy, whether implicitly or explicitly. Um, and so for us, the goal of our Race and Place seminar series has been to essentially elevate our awareness that the work we do can be tied to uh, social and environmental justice intimately. And so, especially with what you have all said, as we further our consciousness in this realm, do we think that this race awareness about having science be that advocacy should become the expectation as opposed to, oh, well, that's what the social, social sciences do, as opposed to, oh, we have our GAS work and, okay, yeah, it ended up helping these people over here, but that was never the intention of the researcher themselves, which I know gets a little dicey when looking at funding as Bethany, you were talking about. You know, I think um, it, it's a really interesting question. And I think that the maybe the line to walk in there is that as researchers, we can't go in and assume at the outset that we know what the conclusion of our work is going to be. We have to maintain a level of objectivity and be ready to um, and be ready to come out with whatever our results say and couch them in the limitations of our study, et cetera. But I think where there's room for this kind of work is, you know, the, the fact that we're not the ones to ask the questions. We're basically trying to bring our tools to do a rigorous analysis to better support communities. And if we do our work correctly, and if the problem is there that we see, we should be able to somehow support the community. Now, if we come up with a question, or I'm sorry, if we come up with a question, if we come up with results that don't support what a community suspects, it doesn't necessarily invalidate their experience or their, um, their concerns. It may be that we need to do more research before we, before we really find that out. But if we work carefully and systematically in service of concerns, we should be able to help move the ball forward. And then, you know, others can do the advocacy. It's not necessarily that our job is to be the cheerleader. Our job, at least the way I see it, is to bring in our expertise to try to answer the questions that community members are articulating and give them the tools to then put it back in the, in the public consciousness. And I think an important maybe extension of that, and maybe Stacy, this, I don't know if this will resonate with you as a, you know, you're not traditionally thought of as a social scientist. Uh, like, you know, a lot of your stuff is biophysical, um, 
and that working with communities is an opportunity to examine the assumptions that are in your science, even though you don't mean them to be. So um, I don't really believe in the idea that science can be completely objective most of the time. I mean, that you can get to sort of um, truths that are more or less beyond social construction, but that there's so much of what science is as its own culture is, is within this kind of like particular assumptions of European colonialization and American expansion. So, um, you know, to think about like in the environmental sciences, the assumption that popul of about the relationship between population growth and environmental degradation, well, that's very uh, tightly linked to a lot of uh, problematic policy, <laughs> uh, pres presumptions of policy outcomes that restrict rights of women and put the burden of global sustainability on developing nations whose resources have been extracted for European benefit. Um, so, so thinking about not, I mean, I'm like thinking about like, what does a scientist who doesn't think of themselves as a, as a social scientist or a, or an advocate get out of working with communities. I think it's a chance to examine your own assumptions and to really ask yourself like, <coughs> why am I aggregating data this way? Who does it serve? What outcomes does it serve? Is it the best way to aggregate data for this problem? Or is it just the easiest way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've, I've, I've got to say that I've never asked myself those questions before, Dr. Cuts, but I. I have to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what reading that automating inequality book will get you. <laughs> and I have to like shout out to my students. I mean, this is something that's really come out of work that Josh Randall and Byron E. Fedora have been have been doing and really struggling with. Like, I don't know, like why should I aggregate, like, should I aggregate to the zip code or to the census tract? I'm like, well, I got more data if I do the zip code, but all the policy about coordinating nonprofits is happening at, at a census track. So I guess I should go with that. Well, and then, you know, the other thing that raises an important question is sometimes you don't have enough data at the census track for the number of people who are eligible to recruit within a certain you know, depending on what you're doing. And then, you know, what is the best that you could do in terms of the limitations of resources that you have or the limitations of participant protections or other types of things then kind of bear on your results, limiting what can be inferred from them. And, then it's like, well, you've found this information, it says something, but maybe it's not as useful to a community as what, you know, is intended. And then there's the question, well, you know, what do you do with all that? It maybe furthers the scientific knowledge, but is that then at the expense of the community or can that still be used in support of the concerns of, of the community? you know, just just thinking about those issues of scale become really important in that sense and how how that information comes into play. I, I think a logical question then that that goes off of what you all have said is are we at the or I guess we should have been at this point already, but at what point in each for example, for a PhD or even master's student, and what point in their research or their careers do you all think that the idea of social, the, the intimacy between social and environmental justice and their own research, regardless of how objective their research seems to be, should that be at the forefront of their mind? Like, should it be in every step? or just in parts of it. So if you take me, for example, I'm doing forest ecology and I could say maybe objectively, we know that trees flower here at this time, that, that's it. But obviously, especially in the Center for Geospatial Analytics, 
everything is spatial. And so it seems no matter, as Bethany was saying, no matter how objective we think something is, there's always some kind of tie-in to a community or an issue. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. The quick answer, yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that this, Ian, this is going to be a, a growing trend. I mean, it really has to be as we struggle to become more socially responsible and culturally relevant and realizing that we have an obligation to impact the broader world and the broader society around us. I absolutely think that, that those, are, those are some very real considerations. Now, will funding trends follow those models? Um, you know, I think as, as, as Bethany and Jen were saying that it may be that we have to sneak in some of that when we can, but um, research is going to follow the funding models. So if the funding models can help, then I think, uh, which, and, 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 and to just backing off from that comment a little bit is that, you know, we have some, we have some weight in being able to change what those directions are. You know, serving on committees, serving on those panels, those, uh, you know, especially with National Science Foundation and some of the other ones, we get to really help determine what some of those funding directions actually are. And they get it, you know. I think a segment of them get it. Maybe not all of them. Yes. But I, yes. you know, I, I think that it's like you're, you know, there's a balance. For instance, like um, in terms of where you're sampling, and you know, I think about it in terms of the the air quality kind of stuff. If I'm looking for some spatial resolution or to represent a population, I need to make sure to fulfill the kind of social mandate of the work that I'm sampling in places that represent the community. And maybe that I'm sampling in some places that don't represent the community as well to provide decent controls and trying to look at it somewhat through the lens of the community by, by providing some, some contrast in, in that case. At the same time, I still need to make sure that the work is defensible by having, say, enough samples. And so what is the number that you're, that you're trying to measure in each subset that you're investigating so that you can have something that, that will be meaningful and that actually can kind of stand on its own if the community needs that data for policymaking or if they, you know, just so that they can feel like they can trust it. You know, I can't say if I don't take enough samples or if I don't sample in enough locations, like here you go, you know, clearly there's a problem if I've only measured in one or two places. And so, so I think it's like that you're bringing your tools to bear, but then you're, you're doesn't mean you're forgetting about the social side of things as you, as you go along. What you can't see is my hands hopping along the desk to illustrate that progression, but um, but that's important to to try to say like it's not just this one thing or this other thing. It's like it just has to kind of be integrated fully through throughout, but not forgetting about these other pieces that also have to come into play to to defend the work. Thank you for sharing. Um, I want to be cognizant. So we are about at the hour and um, we did want to open it up to audience questions on our Google form right now. Uh, we don't have any. Um, Alex has just posted in the chat. If you would like to submit anonymously, you're also welcome to raise your hand um, and chime in with any questions. Um, 
but if we still have a lack of audience questions, that's fine because we have a lot of uh, pre-written questions. Um, so jumping off of uh, Jen, what you were just talking about, um, I think this next question is uh, really poignant. So our graduate students here, um, you know, hopefully we will be, you know, the next industry and, and corporate NGO agency directors, leaders, college professors, etc. So, you know, just as we think that um, social and environmental justice should be part of all the research that we do, then what advice can you give us specifically as graduate students if we want to infuse our work with this and become more cognizant of this, if in some places, uh, you know, we are the only ones doing it, or if we've just been hired at a, at a new job, whether it's industry or not, and then it is seen as risky, or you've been told by others that this is a risky thing to do because there has been backlash before. I mean, Google is a fantastic example of that. Um, so yeah, any of your thoughts would be great. Not everybody at one time then. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I talk with Uche about that every single week, <laughs> like especially the Tim and Grebrud case. So it's kind of like what she wanted to do with her life. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think like I haven't read um, Weapons of Math Destruction. Hmm. Oh yeah, thanks Alex for putting the book titles in the chat. Um, but but when we were talking about it as part of our, the book club element of this data equity course, um, students were talking about how the author talks about her experience working in academia and industry and then kind of like weaving those experiences together. So my short answer is to read the, the preface or introduction of that book um, to kind of see how she negotiated those pathways and kind of brought them together. Um, I don't think she found either one particularly satisfying. <laughs> uh, but another thing is like to advocate, I mean, to figure out ways. So there's like different approaches, right? Like you can be, I don't want to say, but you can be like alpha or beta about it. <laughs> so alpha is like confront it, be direct. Well, this is a problem. Here's why. Beta might be to say, like, here's a real opportunity. Um, yeah, thanks Ian for putting that in the chat. Um, and to present leadership in addressing inequity as, um, as a strategic advantage for whoever you're working, working with and to make incremental steps, um, you know, to explain, to talk about, to talk about the, the assumptions in algorithms or or alternative approaches that you're trying and why that additional sensitivity analysis, for example, is beneficial to your, to your clients um, and their, the outcomes that they're pursuing. Um, and to, you know, just work is not the only place you can make a difference to. <laughs> I mean, I think in academia, especially we forget about the other parts of life. Um, and to, I can't remember Stacy or Jen's point earlier about STEM education at the expense of other pursuits. You know, that I heard um, the NPRs this morning um, about a bipartisan effort to like really support civic education. And that's something I've been reflecting on in my teaching. It's like, regardless of your personal background, if you have a college education, you should know how to like gain information, make a decision and have, feel like you have enough agency to make some participate in some kind of change. And so how do we not teach students a, dis a right decision or a different decision than they might make otherwise, but how to analyze where their information comes from and how to identify places that they can make a difference. So you know, maybe today you don't drive your car to work, you bike instead, and that saves a little bit of fossil fuel. Maybe 
and maybe that's in line with your values and goals and your assessment of the evidence as a worthy investment. Um, and maybe down the road, you take a look at you know, a policy proposal and examine it as a individual, not like a regular old voter <laughs> and, um, and feel like you can call your legislative office or you know run for city council um i think protect i don't know this might sound but like protecting your sovereignty as a person with some amount of disposable income and some amount of um discretionary time is an opportunity, an, an opportunity in all sorts of different ways um, outside of your work. And you don't want to feel like a gigantic hypocrite, probably. <laughs> Most people don't feel great about that. Um, but, you know, work is just one avenue of life where you have, ha have the potential to have a, quite a bit of agency. You know what, Bethany, from listening to you, I thought, you know, what would make a wonderful, and there may be, there, this study might be out there already, but what would make a, a wonderful study is to look at over the years, um, what some of the driving factors were for going into academia and to see if that's changed. And then especially to see even over gender, now that we're starting to gain more appreciable numbers of, 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 of women into the professoriate, it would be interesting to see if the motivations and the reasonings behind that are changing. Now, I have seen some job satisfaction, uh, some climate equity job satisfaction type survey numbers, and I know that those tend to be still uh, pretty pathetic um, when we start looking at things along the gen gender lines. But motivations for going into academia could be interesting. I'm sorry, that just popped into my head while she was talking. So. Mine is too confused by KSAs, government job applications. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna try something else first, it's easier. <laughs> yes. I think yeah. in mine, it's the those who can't Say it again, Jen. I'm sorry. We, I, didn't, we, I don't think we heard you. I said, I think in mine, it's those who can't do teach. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole adage. I remember that. Yep. I remember that as well. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I, I, as Bethany was talking before, I, I think what was kind of going through my mind, thinking about all the places where you can incorporate these things, it's just regardless of what the venue is, it's kind of like, you know, are you asking critical questions? Are you making assumptions? And then when the equity question comes comes to play, it oftentimes, it's not necessarily that somebody is trying actively to hurt another group, but they're thinking about things through their little lens. And, you know, I mean, everybody does that, I do that all of you do that to some extent, but to learn and kind of develop an academic framework for asking questions and listening to people who, you know, might have different perspectives and helping to voice their questions is just a different way of, of thinking about it. Like, you know, who's not at the table mm -hmm. um, and then like, you know, how can we get these people to the table? Now that they're at the table, what's the question that they have? And then it's like, not necessarily, well, like, how can I just crank out 50 publications, but how can I help them using the tools I have? And, you know, as a self-interested person, I'm probably still gonna try to publish about that work um, because I do know that that helps in my, career, I'm not quite sure how as somebody on the non-tenure track, but, um, but, you know, I mean, but there are advantages to 
being active in in the science and writing papers and that kind of thing that that do help me personally but if you're doing something in a way that at least gives voice to other people at least tries to think about assumptions that you might not naturally consider i think is it's an important thing to learn and um and trying to i mean just be a better listener and I mean, that's something in my own life that I have to remember. There's sometimes when I'm kind of like, you know, I'm sure everybody here, including my son who's not here, but like, I know my son thinks sometimes like, ah, if only like they would listen to me. And, you know, I often try like usually like after like an exasperating phone call with my parents who are like, you know, just set in whatever little, you know, vantage point they have to stop and think, I'm not listening to what they're saying or what they're experiencing enough. I'm finding myself exasperated by, you know, what I'm hearing and I need to be listening more and I need to actively remind myself of, of those kinds of things like on a personal level. So even like in your day-to-day -day interactions, thinking about that question, like, you know, how are you respecting other people with different experiences and, and being a good listener. And then, you know, from an academic framework, infusing that into a, a rigorous way to study a problem, um, you know, I think that's kind of where, where that comes in. And, oh, yeah, go ahead. One, I mean, one more point, just really quickly, because, you know, I, and I see, um, you know, we've got Laura and Martine on, on, on the call as well, too. So I'm sure there'll be a testament that, you know, well, I, I do use a few scare tactics with my students, and, and right? But, um, like, get the manuscripts out or you'll never see tomorrow, right? Uh, no. Um, one thing I hope that you know, going through the process of just trying to, to mentor young adults that are going to be those leaders is that if it's not meaningful to you, if you're not enjoying it, if you're not having fun, if you're not doing what you love, then, you know, do something different, do something else. You know, make sure, you know, this is something that's gonna require a lot of your time, a lot of your effort, a lot of intention. So make sure you're enjoying what you're doing. Make sure you love what you're doing. And I think that that naturally leads back to our great, our great, I can't even talk, I'm sorry. Our great care and concern for each other, our communities, and, you know, just everything. So, sorry, I'll shut up. No, you're good. Thank you. Um, Going back to Jen's point about making sure that everyone has a place at the table when we're doing research later after we leave here, I want to bring it back as for the final 20 minutes and focus specifically on us here at CGA um, and looking at those who don't have as large a place at the table as we would like. Um, and so I know that we have a lot of emphasis that's placed on recruitment of students and faculty from diverse backgrounds. Um, but in general, how can we better support them once they are within our academic programs? Because it seems with, and it's, it's getting better, but in general, across the states, a lot of STEM is traditionally, uh, you know, white male. Um, and that, that has been changing, but, uh, you know, we definitely could be doing better here. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts. I know in, um, in forestry and environmental resources, we're, we've been working on this quite a bit. And I don't know that we have any great answers yet. It's still something in progress. But, you know, it's, I think that there's this disconnect sometimes between where you know, faculty think like, oh, I'm, I'm being so welcoming, I'm being so inclusive to my students. And then students are not necessarily seeing that. And 
um, trying to find someone who the students trust enough to share that with is often is often difficult. Um, you know, we have the fantastic Shafney Grays, who a lot of students confide in, and you know, I think listening to her or to someone like her who can bring to light the experiences that our students are having and, you know, so that everybody knows like, maybe things aren't always as good as they can be. And everybody makes mistakes sometimes, you know, I'm sure that there are plenty of times when I say something that's not right or unintentionally offend someone. And there are plenty of times when that happens to me and making a space to say like, oh wait, I said she, I meant they, and quickly moving on or correcting is hard. Or even like, just, I think having, having a new way of thinking where it's like, if you hear something that's not right, people don't always want to step up and correct you. And, you know, like a student doesn't want to say like, oh, no, you, you said the wrong thing. Or a faculty member doesn't necessarily want to call out another faculty member, especially if it's like, you know, somebody who's been in the faculty for 50 years and you've been there for two. Um, you know, so there are all these weird interpersonal dynamics that make it difficult to, to make change. And so like how to bring everybody along is is a challenge. And I don't know that I have great answers other than just trying to take baby steps to do more, more listening and more like, you know, what can we do to make this a comfortable space um, is, you know, that's that's challenging. One thing that I found that has been kind of successful is, you know, like sometimes if I see a student who doesn't show up to class a few times or something like that, and part of me is kind of like, you want to be like, come on, you're not showing up to class, you know? And, you know, your mind goes to, obviously, they just don't care about the class or they don't care about their schooling or blah, blah, blah. And I've tried in the last few years to do something where instead of jumping to that to to stop and ask the student hey is everything okay and that's made space for a lot of really positive interactions where a student has then said no everything's not okay and here's why and i need help or even yeah, everything is okay, but I'm really glad that you noticed. And then stepping back into that space. And that kind of thing I, I think can, can be helpful. Calling out other faculty members if they make insensitive comments or that kind of thing is, um, I don't have a, a great answer to it is, I know that it's something that we should be doing, but sometimes sometimes we feel more courageous than others. You know, Jen, and I know a lot of, a lot of our faculty really care and support our students, but you know, me transitioning through three different institutions, I don't think I ever had one faculty to ask me if I was okay. <laughs> so, but I do know that we've got some really great faculty that, that, that is here that really cares about the students, which is awesome. Yeah, and okay. so go, go ahead. Yeah, I think I think like the key takeaway from what the, I heard from Stacy and Jen is like thinking about what you can do to support the culture among grad students and to just in terms of being a decent human being, like um, you can reach the same outcomes, which for students is to earn a degree by being output focused or community focused. 
And output focus centers the data <laughs> and community focus centers learning with others. Um, and focusing on the data reinforces a scarcity mindset and um, marginalizes your experience as people. And focusing on community focuses is an abundance mindset where everyone is kind of in it together to be successful. Um, and that's not gonna solve all the problems. That's not gonna solve racism in America or sexism in America or xenophobia or really any of those things. But it's just a subtle shift in mindset. Um, and the, I think the more people that can embrace that mindset, um, the more opportunity there is for people to succeed in all kinds of unexpected ways. Yeah. And that's, that's just looking people in the eye. That is just asking people how they're doing. That's asking people to tell you more if um, they say something about an idea they have that doesn't sound exactly like what anything you're interested in, but um, but is you know potentially interesting to that person and kind of validating why they're interested in that. Um, it's the difference between a good luck with that and a yes and cult, like and ha and a yes and culture. It really doesn't take a lot more. Um, you can accomplish the same thing. Um, but I think collectively can feel a little bit better. And then practically it's like when you're in space, when you're in spaces without whatever group might be, you know, like uh, call in culture, <laughs> like not focusing so much on um, people that have overtly harmful views, but people that might just be slipping into easy patterns that are in our society when they're in spaces where they feel like it's okay to do that. So we have about 12 minutes left. So I wanted to end on a fun thought experiment in this realm, of course, of um, environmental and social justice and equity, uh, especially within geospatial sciences. If each of you had as much funding as you wanted, like you set an amount and you got it, to devote for one research or education initiative in this space, then what would you do and why would you do that particular thing? I think we should turn that question around and ask yeah. the students. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great that's idea. A really good idea. Yeah. Not just for the cop out reasons. <laughs> but to to demonstrate what we have said, students are a great source of innovation. <laughs> So that, that's the follow-up document that we'll prepare, but we have to hear your answer first. I think turning it around to the students and maybe kind of in the spirit of EJ, also turning it around to the communities mm. and, you know, like where do they need to prioritize their money? And then again, how can we, how can we help them to get there? Um, but, you know, trying to get away from, the saying like, you know, we know, we know what's best. So just give us the money and we'll make it happen is uh, maybe the mindset we need to get away from. Maybe that's like the cool money on, things. like creating a, a innovation test bed that could try out some of those things. Yeah. <laughs> How about all grad all graduate students and postdocs have unlimited funds and supplies? Somebody has. <laughs> I don't so, think we'd we'd deny that. So you know, I came out of a community. <laughs> I, I came out of a community um, which is interesting. So I came out of a community where a lot of folks did not have opportunities. A lot of folks did not have access. Um, a lot of folks just didn't even have the wherewithal that education was a ladder, was an opportunity to, to rise up, to get out of current circumstances. I mean, when you think about generationally that, you know, you know, your dad, your brother, your uncle, everybody's going to jail. So, you know, kids rising up in those type of environments necessarily see 
that hope and opportunity will involve the prison system or the court system at some time or what have you. And so just, you know what, having resources where education can reach all of these levels of all of these levels of community, all of these levels uh, of structure where we can be a bigger or a greater influence on, you know, the, the K through 12 education systems, opportunities that provide hope and, 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 and career and just aspirations for folks that don't yet see it or have those levels of advantage. I think that if I had the funds to do that, I would be much happier. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good. I, I would vote to give my funds to Stacy's idea. And the graduate students. So. Because you just, yeah. Well, then you got to execute your plan. But I think, yeah, See, I think that's, that's, who do, that's who does all the real work, right? You know, we sit back and, you know, they bring us the papers and the manuscripts. We look at it and like, mm, yeah, this looks about this. Go back and try just a little bit harder, but this is looking pretty good. <laughs> You're not the control freak that I am, Stacey. <laughs> No, we, we trust our graduate students to really do the hard work to do it. <laughs> yes. Well, we have about eight minutes left, so are there any oh, final you're comments? Not getting off that, you're not getting off it, brother. Come on. All the money, man. Let's hear it. From me? Come on. Just one research or education. Lord, Stacy, you didn't. You know, I didn't look at this and think of a response earlier. <laughs> Trust me, I didn't look at it. I, that's why I made the question so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to be honest with you. When I was like typing in the ten minutes before when I logged in was when I was looking at the questions. <laughs> Bethany, uh, when we did our homework. All right, Ian. All the money in the world. Come on, man. It would, it, honestly, it would probably be trying to get every, I mean, I, I will always love forest ecology and I'll always go there. But for me, what got me interested in, in environmental studies to begin with was the fact that I was able to do an immersive experience in the national parks through the Student Conservation Association. If it wasn't like that, that one thing I didn't expect to get in shaped the rest of what I did in undergrad and what came after that. So granted, I know that the people who I was with in that program, even though it is nationwide, we're mostly white. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people I've spoken to never knew that this existed, even those of us who are in environmental stuff. Mm -hmm. So I would put that money and do more of a, like if I could fund a thing where any, any child in the States who wanted to do this, to do an immersive uh, educa uh, natural education thing, if you want to call it that, and they can go, they, they will be fully funded to go anywhere in the United States to a different, whether it's a park or a city that has urban, urban parks or something like that, to let them have that experience, because so much of the time you have to have the money in order even to have that opportunity. Um, but also when doing these things, also being told of the actual land history of the places we're going to. I mean, for me reading right now, Tending the Wild by Kat, M. Cat Anderson, um, you know, for me coming from California, she describes the place before European contact. I never knew. I've had, ex I've had education there my whole life. I, I knew nothing of this. Absolutely. So grounding everyone and then giving everybody the actual chance to go see this stuff, because I feel like getting that connection to the land even though we are not the original inhabitants, shapes your understanding of things in such a larger context. And I know some studies have backed that up a little bit, but I wish there was something large like that. And I mean, even just to build on that, and Stacy, we've had so many conversations about this is just making those kinds of enrichment experiences um, within reach for students who, who not only don't have those opportunities or have to, you know, maybe this is more at the undergraduate level, but have to work and can't do those kinds of environmental immersion types of programs or 
research programs or you know community engagement types of programs that having having those funds available so that those horizons are broadened and that you know they know that these things are available to them it's not just for certain kinds of kids who don't have to you know wait tables on the weekend or or what have you i think that would be helpful oh i know what i would do the money this is not my idea. This is Roslyn, Caitlin, and Jenna's idea. But well, it's a good one, and they're not going to, well, so I guess I'll give them jobs to keep doing this. But they have the idea of doing an environmental justice certificate. And the way that it would work best um, would be as a standalone graduate level certificate where community organizers and other people who don't have necessarily higher formal education but have a lot of experience would have an would be able to participate and gain access to universities' skill sets that are useful to their communities. So, you know, you talked about the community you came from, but there are people in that community that are working very hard to make a change, and none of their experience or knowledge is documented in a way that's helping their income, their personal income level, even though they're smart and super capable. So this would kind of that that element being able to overcome like the conventional ad admissions requirements for this sort of cert certification would be a huge opportunity to credential what's already going on there and i would use my money to like set up a trust fund so they won't have to pay for this, that experience <laughs> um but to combine that with um i with it, opportunities for students currently enrolled in a diverse diverse graduate education from across the institution that are engaged and invested in environmental justice, but who don't necessarily have a community around that because the communities are, at, well, first of all, at a predominantly white institution, um, centering white experiences with the environment like um, the traditional conservation movement and new environmental paradigm. So it's a dispersed experience. There's people in planning, there's people in parks, recreation, and tourism, there's people in, in natural resources and CGA that, um, that need an intellectual home for environmental justice or whatever the next thing is. I read today <laughs> that it takes 17 years for evidence to make it into policy. And then I backtracked that from, you know, we, it's about right. You know, we're on track, environmental justice really I mean, gain like late 80s, early 90s was when the movement was gaining lots of policy evidence to support their claims at a national scale. <laughs> um, so 30 years later, we're starting to see environmental justice organizing for curricular design at the university. The act of it, like the 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 people act acting for equity and justice have reframed issues. It's more intersectional. Um, in terms of how they're approaching issues. Um, it's less centered, I think, on the church than the environmental justice movement has been. That's a slight aside. I was just, that's that, that, that just fact, 17 years. I'm like, oh, this long game, okay. Mm -hmm. um, we need the money. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but but to, to create that community to, um, and to organize it in a way that recognizes um, the and uh, leverages sounds like kind of a gross way to frame it, but that oh, I know a better way. So that that sees differences in capacity as mutually supportive rather than in deficits of group that exist in groups that don't have the same capacities you do. I think it's a huge paradigm shift for an academic program and has the potential to really um, both change our conventional education structures and outcomes and who benefits from those and to also um, invest in communities in ways that we haven't necessarily thought about in the past. So that's how I'd spend the money. My mouse drop. <laughs> well, I know that I, for one, would love to see this conversation go on between uh, the three of you, but unfortunately it is five o'clock, so we're gonna have to call it off. Um, I want to thank 
the three of you for doing this, honestly. Thank you um, for also giving the individual seminars, Jen and Bethany earlier. Um, I'm sorry, again, we couldn't have Mickey here. I know he would have had really good uh, answers to these questions as well. Um, but also thank you, Stacy, for, for being a panelist. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Thank, thank you for stepping up and moderating, Ian. Well, thanks to the GGSO for organizing and for to really all the students who have just really stepped into this um, opportunity to make change at the university, um, you know, and for being so prepared to do it when faculty, <laughs> faculty are, and I don't want to throw staff on the bus, faculty are, slow, yeah. are slower, are, are slower and maybe like more set in kind of the institutional structure and, and not, I don't, yeah, and just not, you know, are, are, I mean, there's benefits, you need both approaches, I think, but um, just the energy this GGSO and, and other student groups have put into really like being so steadfast in their commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion in, in all that they do um, and pushing themselves and others has just been super inspiring um, in all sorts of ways. Yeah, and it pushes us forward and hopefully all of the faculty will start listening to the students and we can keep making progress. You guys showed us how to do it, so thank you. Yeah. I'd like to clarify, of course, there's a full team. It's not just me, but uh, of course. Um, also, before we end, a quick plug for the students. There is a CNR grad student community discussion that is happening on Friday. There will be breakout rooms. I'm putting the Google Doc in the chat so you can see what those are. Um, a couple of us from GGSO are going to be uh, facilitating those breakout rooms as well. So please, if you can make that, um, we'd be happy to have you. Uh, otherwise, that is it from GGSO for this term uh, in terms of lunch and learns. So um, this was our inaugural event in terms of focusing on race and you know race and place in a geospatial context. Um, there, we might do this again in the fall. We might do it again next spring. We don't know, but we definitely, as Stacy said at the beginning, we have a lot of exciting things happening for the fall, and we're definitely going to continue this discussion. Um, moving forward without a doubt. So once again, thank you everyone for coming and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Good seeing everybody.